because you were doing the second team at Middlesex. And, and I mean, there were some good players that you worked with that came through. Andrew Strauss, Ed Joyce, O.A. Shah. But you saw those guys at their very early uh, stages of their career. I mean, someone like Strauss, did you think straight away, wow, this guy's going to, you know, he, he could go all the way? No, I told him to go back to Radley College and play rugby. Um, <laughs> uh, he wasn't all that keen on it, Strauss. He, he doesn't like me saying this, but he was a bit overweight. Um, Durham University boy. Um, loved loved the burger, loved the pint. He had a talent, of, you know, you saw he had a talent. Um, he had another one, a friend of his, Ben Hutton. He had a talent as well. O.A. had an immense talent. Wow, that boy at 15. Uh, wow, well, he was he was brilliant. Very, very good. Probably didn't get to the heights he should have done, but that's life. Um, I must mention David Nash, otherwise he'll kill me. He was a very talented boy. Um, probably didn't, he didn't probably fill his potential. But the one that came through the door, uh, but always came through the door late that I just, you could you could draw on all day long. He was the closest I saw to Gower, uh, was a little Irish boy called Ed Joyce. Ed turned up on the recommendation of Mike Hendrick, who was coach of Ireland at the time. And every time he came, he stayed with his sister in North London somewhere. We were playing at RAF Uxbridge, which is not the easiest place in the world to get to. And for some of that reason, he was only available at those games. So it was always late, Ed, but I couldn't, I couldn't have a go at him because this kid was exceptional. And, you know, and as I was leaving that door, whenever it was in 2000, 2001, I remember him saying to me, there's a boy, very, very young boy. Um, that was when he came to say, there's a very young boy coming from Ireland again that will be a genius. And he wasn't wrong in Owen Morgan. Um, you know, I was lucky there with contacts, we had a boy come from um, Stoke, a boy called Follett, who was riddled, riddled with injuries. And he would have played for England without a doubt. His debut was eight for 17 or eight for 27 against Durham at Lords. Wow, wonderful. But we had a little boy um, uh, from Devon, a boy called David Lye, farmer's boy, bashing it all around schools cricket in Devon. I had a friend down there, Jim Aldis, said to me, Gunner, you've got to have a go at this boy. You've got to have a look at him. So we got him to Lords. He got a double hundred in the under 19s. He got 100 in the second team. I think he got 190 again in the 90. He was just fabulous, fabulous player. Just very simple lad. Just saw it, hit it, which was a breath of fresh air. Um, sadly, he got a very serious knee injury and had to retire, I'd say, 21. Didn't make it. I don't think he got in the first thing, which is criminal. It's criminal. But, that you know, that's sport. That's what does happen to people. Um, but he did deserve that because he, he and his family uh, were just charming people. Charming. Were you, were you ambitious to be first team coach at Middlesex? I think I probably was. I'd be mad to say that I wasn't. Um, I did a few games, did a... You know, when Mike came in, we had John Buchanan come in and Mike Gatton came in um, and it all sort of moved around a little bit and then Mike went to do a bit of second team cricket. I went up to do the first team and you, yeah, it's a different buzz. It's a different buzz. Um, but the, the side of it, that, that the, doing the first team is fine because you're just solely dealing with those guys, those 15 players that there you're solely dealing with. When you're doing the second team, you're overseeing all youth cricket. Well, I can tell you there's probably 100 coaches sitting here or 10 coaches sitting here listening to this and they'll know what I'm just about to say. The players and the boys are, and girls are actually brilliant people. They're young, they're keen, they're enthusiastic. But the parents, wow, wow. They all think they've got Brian Lara on their hands or whoever it might be. Um, and that became painful became very painful because you were going to watch the under 11 game just to see you know what's coming through talking to the young coaches see how they're doing you know watch the under 13s the dreaded time was the under 15s I used to oh Esco schools tournament in Taunton and places you just got bombarded you got bombarded in the end I went with the one week I went I didn't even put a middle six tracksuit on I just went in jeans and t-shirt um, and that didn't work but no, that was the bit that I found very difficult because it's difficult. Parents have have given a lot for that moment, 
you know, and the boys got a hundred in a in an Esker schools game or a Taunton festival playing for his you know, county. You know, it's a big thing, and you know, some parents, you know, play their life through their children. But I found that very difficult. Uh, and as people would know me, I'm very honest on that, and I'll give you an honest answer. And sometimes that was probably not the way to go, an easier let down. But I found that very difficult. Very difficult. When was the first time you umpired a game? Oh, God. <laughs> I did a game, a second team game, a uh, first team game at Uxbridge against Northampton when Alan Whitehead, bless his cotton socks, got the wrong day. So there I was in my Lucas A blue tracksuit. Um, Alan Jones had gave me his umpire's jacket. Uh, and I stood at square leg and I thought this is all right this and then until Keith Brown appealed for a stumping off John Embry and I wasn't watching I was paying out I was talking to Richard Montgomery I think or whoever it might have been um, and I gave it not out which is what I did for most of my career after that but I did that and Alan was brilliant because he'd driven from Somerset and if, if people remember Alan Whitehead he had a nice big truck big caravan on the back of it so he didn't actually rush himself when he turned up to Uxbridge. He actually took his time, reversed the caravan in, got the electricity sorted out. And I thought, well, he'll only be another 20 minutes, get himself changed and whatever. No, nope, not out. Went down the road, got the racing post, came back, had some lunch. And he decided to pop on the field about half past three, which was hilarious. But when I walked off, I didn't, I didn't quite put to my mind, well, actually, I, but then that's it. Mike Gatton said to me, he said, you look natural there, Gunner. And I actually, typical Mike, no, I, I thought he was taking the mickey out of me, so I just let it go. Uh, and then a couple of occasions, the second team cricket guys uh, run well or whatever, and I just went on the field. Um, and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And then when I got released by Middlesex, I finished, the, they wanted me to, to do the end of the season. So I hung around till August. And then I bumped into a couple of ex-colleagues, uh, Neil Aberley uh, and Sainsbury. Uh, I think of his name in a minute. Sainsbury, Peter Sainsbury. Both coaches, one at Hampshire, one at uh, Warwickshire, said to me, Gunnar, you've got the personality to be an umpire. And I was thinking, all those years, I've abused umpires. No, I can't be doing that. Poacher turning gamekeeper. That's, no, that's hysterical. And in the meantime, I'd set this business up that I dreamt of. Uh, doing grounds and it was all going well got some schools uh, anyway I came back and spoke to my darling wife Giant and said look this is what's been said she said do it and I was like quite taken back there's no umming and ahhing do it and I, so I thought right I'll, I'll apply to the ECB they had two fixtures at the end of the season so I went off and did it but I went back to one of the guys the first day I did it it was wonderful just, I loved it. I loved every second of it because I was a part of the game and whatever. And anyway, I came back and said to her, why did you say go and umpire? And she said, you've been in this since you've been 15. Since the day you've left school, you've been in it. Give it a go. And thankfully, God knows how many years on, I can't thank her enough for it. Because it's been, it's been a great, great journey, umpire. Great journey. Fantastic journey. What, um, how difficult is it now, Gunnar, compared to then for, for, to get on the umpiring list? There's a lot of ex-players are trying now to get to become umpires, aren't they? Yeah. Is it more I difficult, think you think? I think it's even more difficult now because I do believe in a, in a very, very positive way. Um, and I've had the opportunity via the ECB to go round and watch these up-and-coming uh, new umpires that have never played first-class cricket. Um, and, wow... Yeah. There is some people, boys and girls, you know, early 20s who have taken up umpiring, played a bit of club cricket, thought about it, gone on courses umpiring. Oh, wow. Excellent. Excellent. Just know the game inside out. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know whether they'd played 100 test matches or they haven't played anything. You know, I still will say that probably one of the best or the best umpire in county cricket at this moment is Neil Bainton. 
uh, who's a postman, and he won't mind me saying that, Neil. Um, he loves being a post. He's out on the shift probably right now doing the Christmas post. Um, he played 30-11 cricket. He said at his highest level, I think he said. But he is an outstanding umpire. He's had to work damn hard to get where he's got to, but he deserves to be, and he's been unlucky not to get any higher. But there are the ex-players who thought they were going to just come wandering back into the game um, will have a real shock now, the real shock, because there are people around uh, through the hard work of the ECB uh, and the umpiring unions that are around. And this is not just in England, this is worldwide at the moment. Um, who are going to come into this game and they are going to take it by storm because it's a different game now. Um, they're going to take a bit of a while to get to DRS and that's when your world changes. Once you're in DRS country, then throw your ego into your bag and run away. I'm sure we'll get questions about that later on. Um, but within four, well, five or six years, you, you were umpiring international cricket. Now, that first game you did, that ODI at the Oval, well, tell us how you felt walking down the steps of Daryl Hare that day, because you were still relatively, in umpiring terms, relatively inexperienced, weren't you? Inexperienced? That's an understatement of the week, that one. I walked down, I didn't walk down there. I don't even remember walking there. I remember floating down there and tripping over steps because I was actually another side of it. I was umpiring with one of my heroes. I love Daryl. He's just a wonderful, good bloke. And... Um, He's a bit like me. He can say the wrong thing at the wrong time. But deep down, he's got a kind heart. He's a good fellow. He was a good umpire. And he was a stickler for the game to be played the right way, uh, which I admired. Uh, I do remember asking him just before. It was a red-hot day at the Oval. Are we going to wear ties? And he just turned and looked at me. And he said, when the ICC tell us we're not going to wear ties, gonna we won't. And uh, that put my put me right in my place straight away. And he didn't mean it that way, but that's how it was. Um, but it was wonderful. But the worst thing about it was it was two blokes batting for England who I'd just finished coaching. You know, and it was just a nightmare. There was Andrew Strauss standing there, tremendous vast bowling at him. And I think, oh, don't hit him on the pads, please. Please, all that coaching is going to be wasted. And a very young, it must have been one of Jamie Dalrymple's very early games. But thankfully, um, the groundsman at the time at the Oval had produced an absolute flat thing. So there was hardly anything that the batsman missed. I think it was 300 and plenty, played 300 and plenty. And I didn't really have much to do. But it was just it was an amazing experience. I never saw that adrenaline buzz of doing something like that and standing at square leg and on the odd occasion taking a glance around the ground yeah that that was that was wonderful wonderful experience and i mean in those early days you you loved it so much if the icc rang you at 24 hours notice and asked you to go to dubai or somewhere like that you were off you were off weren't you i was mowing a football pitch at burnham football club on a friday afternoon at four o'clock uh half past three sorry and I caught the seven o'clock flight from Heathrow to Dubai. I've got a friend of mine to finish off the mowing and marking. I went straight to Heathrow Airport, into Dubai, landed at 6 a.m. The first ball went down at 8 a.m. in Dubai. Uh, that was me. I was, no. The only time I moved quicker than that was when the pub bolt doors opened. That was the only time I could ever move that quick. But that was for me. I just loved that ICC thing, the travel meeting people the glamour yeah well yeah because i'm a glamour boy i know you can look at me now yeah, but meeting jeff crow again you know jeff was a fantastic friend of mine through a bit of county career but my 10 years of coaching and, and playing in new zealand it was wonderful wonderful time to be with him um and i just then i just kept meeting people all around the world that i'd either played with or coached with or drunk with um uh, it was wonderful. It was just, just a brilliant experience. And and it, and it finished on a high as well. Finishing the World Cup um, with India there, packed house. That was me done. That was wonderful. Wonderful. Do you think now, with all the, the, the pressure that umpires are under, compared to when you started, 
and the traveling involved that, you, you know, you did nearly 15 years on the international circuit. Is that going to be possible for some of the guys coming onto the the, the, the new ICC umpires to, to, to realistically do it for that long? No, no I, think I think this is the last of the, if this succeeds now where the home umpires are doing the home series like in Australia and India now, Oxford Rifle Tucker, Blocker Wilson, four very, very high-class umpires. Plus, they've got another three underneath. Uh, England, the boys did superb here. There was so much test uh, cricket going on. Nine weeks stuck in the same hotels, not allowed to move, go on the park. Doing an amazing job. Yeah, they got a few wrong, but they've got a few wrong if they were not stuck in a hotel room. But that... that I thought that was an extraordinary performance and people pick holes in what bits and pieces of what they did. But uh, one of the guys there, young Kelbra, said to me, he said, I think, God, you weren't here because you might have jumped off the top of the roof because I couldn't sit in a hotel room with me under a grand now. <laughs> and there are some extraordinarily good umpires around. It's been uh, the work by the home bodies, like I, ECB here and Cricket Australia, Cricket South Africa, um, you know, I was lucky enough to go to the World Cup this year, under 19, last year, this year. And at the end of it, the next group of umpires were there uh, and at the ladies in um, Australia. The standard of umpiring was as good as I've ever seen, as good as I've ever seen, whether it's Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Australia, India, Zimbabwe, you know, poor Zimbabwe, you know, not played a great deal of cricket over the last few years. They've got three top umpires. Um, there's a guy in in Ireland, uh, Roly Black. He's as good as anyone I've seen. Um, Young-ish. He'd be, he'd, be, he'd be happy for me to call him young. But he needs exposure and hopefully Ireland will play um, a bit of domestic and international cricket this year or next season. Um, and you will see an outstanding umpire. Outstanding. So I, I am very upbeat about people coming through um, not the usual ranks that everyone always thinks and adheres to that you've got to play X amount of county cricket. Um, I don't see that happening. Um, I see the elite panel within two years for financial reasons and the standard of umpiring going um, I think there'll you know there'll be some groups that will go and do major tournaments what ICC call global tournaments but I think you might find that uh, uh, a Lord's Test in the Ashes might have Bruce Tucker at one end and Richard Kettlebrough at the other end and the hardest working person ever is the third umpire that is the job of a night that's the nightmare job that used to be a glass of wine and enjoy yourself but now you it's madness. But that's the way I will see this game going. Or, and that will be just because umpires are that good. Um, but it will satisfy the needs that one's at one end and one's at the other. Or they'll go the whole hog and say, right, Bob, off we go. How hard is it for you, it going to be for you, Gunnar, to stop, stop, stop umpiring and stop being involved in cricket after the career you've had in the game? Desperately hard. Uh, I, I don't look umpiring you're gonna I'm gonna miss that oh god I'm gonna miss that uh it's the crack with the lads and you know it, good fun good fun nine hours of absolutely good fun I love every minute of it um there was a couple of occasions last year when I was having the old temperature testing that I was hoping it was going to 40 because it was just, <laughs> the, game, the game was going nowhere but the bloke said to me if it's 40 gunner you're dead so I left it at that um that will be difficult. I'd like to stay that some side of it, maybe help in that respect. But if I look, I'm not going to hang around just for the sake of hanging around. But at some stage, a deck chair and a pint at the top of the ground at Hove, that sounds all right as well. A game of golf in the morning, maybe. But the thing is with it, what, what, on a serious note now, is these guys hit the cricket ball as hard as, a, you know, I, when my era, it's Sir Ian Botham. Sir Vivian Richards, Gordon Greenwich. Oh, my God, they hit the ball hard. But these guys now, they're hitting them with railway sleepers 
and they're you know make it even worse they're running at you you know i had a young kid last year in a 2020 game i won't tell you his name but he asked me to stand up over the top of the stumps i just looked at him if he was completely barking you know i ended up being 15 meters back because at the other end there was a guy jason roy who was looking at pummel this bloke all over the place so i think you've got to be a bit careful how long you go on for i think this you know, the age of an umpire will come down like the player i mean if you look when i was playing there was guys you know 40 45 still having a game of cricket in county cricket you know you won't see that and i don't think you'll see it in umpire you know you look at these lads now um most of the guys are in good shape real good shape um umpire um, they look after themselves a lot better. They don't have too many pints at lunchtime like the other boys did. Um, so once again, I was born in the wrong era. Brilliant. Thanks, Gunnar. I'm going to hand over to...